Uh, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we have a presentation of the seminars of the museum, and our guest is uh, Chema Mar Jose Maria Martin Duran Chema for everybody. And he passed me his CV in Spanish, so I have to translate it now to English. He studied biology and, and, and get the PhD in genetics in the University of Barcelona, uh, working on uh, embryonic development of planarias. He doesn't say any date, so it means that he it was recently, not, not enough. And then he did a postdoc in Norway, in Bergen, in the SARS Institute with and Andreas Hechnol, who has been around once, one time ago, was around here, and working on development, Evo Devo, I guess, Evo Devo in different marine invertebrates. Uh, mostly uh, looking at the evolution of the gastrulation modes and the morphology of the nervous system. <laughs> Since 2018, he's PI in the Queen Mary University of London, and he has an ER ERC starting grant uh, looking at the topic of this talk today. And he will show us most recent results. So, yeah, well thank done. you. Cool. Well, thanks, Rafa, for the introduction. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today and being allowed to, to introduce some of the work that we've been uh, doing in my lab in the last few months. So today I'm going to talk about the evolution of bilaterian life cycles. Um, and most of the work that we do is trying to, to to understand how this fascinating diversity of, of animal forms and, and functions and behaviors evolved. And, and we do so by looking at how different animals with different morphologies uh, develop. So at the end of the day, the way the morphology of the animals will somehow emerge during embryonic development, so this process in which one single cell will give rise to an entire multicellular organism with a different morphology. So by comparing how this process takes place and how different species follow different evolution, developmental pathways, we perhaps can try to ascertain how these different morphologies and, and eventually more uh, behaviors and functions also uh, evolve and emerge. Um, in particular, one characteristic that probably sticks out when we're looking at different animals is the fact that in some species, embryonic development results in, in something, in a hatchling, in, in a newborn, that is very, very similar to the adult form, like for instance, uh, us no? or, or mouse. But in many other groups, uh, embryonic development results in something that is often very, very different from the animal, uh, the adult form, right? Like the caterpillar of a butterfly or this little snail that will be swimming in the water column. And therefore, a very simple way to classify animal development is through the fact that uh, whether it can form or it can be uh, direct, so that then embryonic development forms directly the adult form, or it can be uh, indirect, okay? That there's, uh, whether there's an intermediate stage that is different from the adult, that is what we call uh, a larva, okay? And uh, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we can classify indirect development in two main modes, based on whether the larva um, eats. It's here. Then I think it's here. Whether the larva eats or whether the larva uses maternal resources to, to, to live and, and swim around or, or live around if there's a terrestrial environment. Uh, if the larva lives on maternal resources, this is what we call non-feeding, olecytotrophic, because it will basically have the yolk that the mother, pro the, the mother provided during the embryogenesis. And if the larva actually eats, it will be feeding or in, for, for, for those, uh, those larvae living in the, in the water column in the ocean, it will be what is called the planktotrophic, because this will be tiny, minute, and they will be swimming in the water column and eat, eating mostly plankton, okay, uh, phytoplankton. Um, the larvae, some, something like the caterpillar that I show you, uh, 
can actually be extremely diverse, especially when looking at uh, the diversity of animals and, and phyla that are in the, in the oceans. So all these are, are larvae, different larvae, and, and this is just a, a, a really tiny representation of the extreme diversity of larva forms that we can find when we get just simply, a, a, I don't know, a falcon tube of, of a plankton toe, right? Uh, and one thing that it's pretty obvious is that larvae can be very similar to the, even when they are intermediate stages and not the adult form, larvae can be uh, very similar to the adult form. And then here, for instance, this is a suya larvae, uh, larva that is, <coughs> uh, it's a crustacean, right? It would be a shrimp. So you already see more or less the shrimp-like shape of the animal, or this is an alpleus larva, also another crustacean, but they can be extremely different from the uh, adult form. So this is, for instance, a sea urchin larva, this would be a starfish, this is a foronid, so that's a worm, uh, that's another worm, that you see there, another worm. Um, so th th there's this thing about what is the relationship between the adult form, the larva, and how these things are playing together, right? But also larvae are uh, important for many other aspects of, of animal bi biology and can have an important impact uh, to us as well. Um, larvae are important and are the way many invertebrates animals uh, disperse. So they are critical for the ecology of most of the marine animal phyla. So for instance, if you compare the dispersal capacity of, uh, of a vertebrate, like a fish, that doesn't have a larva and that it can be an active swimmer, and you compare it with the capacity, the dispersal capacity of invertebrates that are more sessile or they are less mobile, but that they have an intermediate larval stage, you see that they can actually disperse as far as something that is way more active, thanks to this intermediate state that will be minute swimming and will be dispersing in the, in the water, okay? So it's critical for ecology but it's also important for, for economy for us. Many of the animals that we culture, that we harvest, that we eat, have this intermediate larval stage. So we need to, to the critical, critical uh, thing, for instance, for, for, for culturing oysters is being able to uh, grow the larvae of the oyster, metamorphose the larvae of the oyster, so that you have the juveniles that I can grow and so on and so forth. For us, for my lab and for the purpose of the talk, uh, what we are interested in is understanding why larvae exist and what is the role, the developmental and the evolutionary role of larvae. Um, and this has been a recursive question. So already from the times of Darwin, they were asking like why there are these little creatures that are completely you know, crazy in terms of their morphology, completely different from, 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 the, from the adult forms. I mean, at, at the moment, right now, there's still larvae that you can keep and then, and then find in the water column that you don't have any idea of what actually the animal, the adult animal is, right? And, and larvae have played major roles in all our theories of how animals have diversified, how us humans have actually evolved. No? And then this is, for instance, uh, the theory of Garstan, uh, a, a, a British zoology, on how uh, vertebrates, Amphioxus accordate, evolve, right? And always involving a, a larval form. So the evolution of, uh, of, of larvae has, has been a major topic in, in, in Evodivo, in uh, evolutionary developmental biology. Uh, and basically, uh, if you look at the, all the literature and all the scenarios and theories that have been posed over the years, there are two main uh, scenarios, there are two main hypotheses on how, on, on how larvae evolve and what actually larvae are. And the first scenario is what is called the intercalation. So in, this is, that would be the drawing of an adult, so it's kind of a worm, and this is the, would be the drawing of a larva, so it's kind of like this bowl, swimming, tiny little bowl, and in red is the novelty. So the intercalation scenario uh, says that ancestrally all animals were adults, so all the adult forms that we know today is what was ancestral, and then somehow at some points in evolution there were different groups, animal groups, that intercalated a larval form to improve uh, uh, dispersal capacity or to uh, colonize a new niche and so on and so forth. And how uh, this intercalation happened is because somehow there were genes acting in the adult that were repurposed to make a larva. Uh, 
okay, that, that's the, this, uh, this is what we call co-option. So there were genes in the adult that were, were co-opted to form a new structure that is what we call today larva, okay? Co-option of adult programs into the larva. The other theory is exactly the opposite. So the other theory says, no, 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 animals ancestrally were larvae. So when we go to the Cambrium or before the Cambrium, all animals were larvae. And it is the adult that somehow got added at the end of the life cycle of a larva, okay? And that's why this scenario is called the terminal addition. And uh, this basically would post that all different adult forms that we see today evolve independently, okay? And they do it by just simply making new, adult, new programs, new developmental programs that were added independently in different animal phyla. So these are the two main theories, and people, you know, even today, there are some people that think, no, this is A, and then there are other people that say, no, that's B. Uh, there's no consensus. We really don't understand how larvae evolve, okay, and what are they. So that's basically the question that we uh, made a few months or a few years ago. So how did larvae evolve? Can we uh, try to uh, shed new light on, on this particular question? And my lab uh, works on, on spiralians. So I think that probably you are all familiar with these. These are bilaterians. So this is the three main groups of bilaterally symmetrical animals. I guess that many of you work here uh, with vertebrates, with, with uh, mammals and fish. Uh, and this is the group that is called deuterostomia and also involves some uh, invertebrates, like for instance, starfish and, and sea urchin. Um, yeah. um, the other big group of animals uh, that include uh, model systems that a lot of people work on are the ectesothorans, so the group of animals that mold, that change their, shed their, their cuticle, and that's uh, arthropods and nematodes. But in reality, uh, when we look at the diversity of body plants and the diversity of phyla that in, in bilaterians, in bilaterally symmetric animals, the uh, most diverse group is actually Spiralia. This big group, this third group that is often overlooked, that not so many people, well, there are people looking at them, uh, but not so many people uh, in, in, in comparison uh, study. <coughs> Within this group, we actually have 16 animal phyla, 14, 16, depending on what you consider a phyla, which is actually roughly half of the animal kingdom. So half of the animal kingdom is here, although we really know very little about how they are, how they evolve, how they develop, their ecology. So that's a big unknown, and that's what actually uh, what I like. Okay? Uh, one of the most fascinating and interesting things about the Spirelians is that they uh, get their name, Spirelia, by the type of an, uh, development that they have, that is called spiral cleavage. And it's basically because when they divide early in development, cells will start moving in different directions, just changing uh, um, um, the, the, the direction of the mitotic spindle will change alternatively uh, during early development. And that basically gives this arrangement of cells in a spiral form that gives the name. Uh, I, will not talk in the uh, I will not speak in this talk about this, uh, but I will focus on another characteristic of Spirelia, that is the fact that they have a very particular type of larva that is called the trochophore larva. This is somehow debated, but let's just keep it simple and say that the trochophore larva that is here typically and historically exemplified by the, the larva that many annelids, so segmented worms, show, uh, is probably common somehow in a, in a simplified form to all this group. Again, this is a simplification because when you look at the larvae of Spirelians, you will find an extreme diversity of forms. You will have something, creatures that actually look really, really extraterrestrial uh, compared to what we know on, on the adult forms. And uh, actually, this would a very simplified drawing, um, the, the critical thing that kind of probably defines all trochophore larvae is the presence of this band of, of cilia that is just above the, the mouth. And then the beating of, the, of these cilia will bring food towards the mouth and also propel the, the, the larva, okay? So that's the trochophore larva. 
Within Sparelia, we focus on, on these guys. Uh, we work on, on annelids, on segmented worms mostly. And uh, most of the annelids that have been studied uh, belong to, this, uh, to either of these two uh, main groups that are called either sedentaria, that would be more or less like earthworms and leeches and some other alleys that are uh, living in the, in the ocean, and then errantia, that would be the, those that are more active and active predators and so on. <coughs> Sorry. And the thing is that these two large groups are actually quite nested within the annelids, so then by studying this, you cannot get a good idea of how annelids evolve. And that's why one uh, important aspect of the work that we've been doing in my lab is establishing new systems that have a more, uh, let's say, basal phylogenetic position, and then, therefore it can allow, they can allow us to reconstruct the, the evolution of annelids. And in particular, we've been establishing these species, Owenia fusiformis, uh, as a model system. Uh, it belongs to the sister lineage to Sedentaria and Errantia, and therefore, when comparing or by comparing Owenia with either uh, or any uh, species in these two uh, groups, you can actually infer and reconstruct the ancestral node to, to, to all annelids, and that's actually very powerful to then being able to infer um, evolutionary uh, trajectories, okay? Uh, we've been establishing this animal as a system to, to do the developmental biology mostly, but we've been also uh, sequencing the genome. We've actually generated um, probably the best annelid genome uh, at the moment out there. And then this is just to show that uh, Owinia has uh, 12 chromosomes, and, and this, you know, sister to the rest of basal, so to speak, slow evolving position, is actually even seen at the genomic level. So you can even trace uh, chromosomes that are in Owenia down to mollusk and actually even down to, to us. So chromosomes that we have, for instance, chromosomes, all these chromosomes are in, 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 in amphioxus, so it is the ancestral of the chordate, and they are fully represented unchanged in, in these annelids. So they are actually being static during evolution, during over 600 million years of evolution. This uh, slow uh, evolutionary rate is also uh, seen at the level of, uh, for instance, uh, gene content. Uh, you see how this, is, this basically is plotting uh, gene content uh, across different metathoan lineages, and then you see how Owenia here has a very similar gene content to, uh, to uh, invertebrate chordates, uh, cnidarians, uh, sea urchins, and so on, and way more conserved than many other annelids. So this is actually a very powerful system that we've been establishing in order to illuminate uh, evolution of annelids, but also, of course, evolution of, of spiralians and generally evolution of animals. <coughs> okay, so that brings us then to uh, the actual question that we uh, try to answer during this work. So we work a lot with Owenia fusiformis uh, that has this larva, this plantotrophic feeding larva that is very, very, uh, I mean, it's very beautiful, at least for me. It's called Amitraria. It looks pretty much like a UFO, a swimming UFO. Uh, in the lab, we also keep two other annelid species that are uh, Capitella teleta and Dimorphilus chirociliatus. So all these are annelids, and then you can tell definitely this when looking at the adults. Uh, so they are all worms, and they are all segmented. So they are pretty similar as an adult. And they all share the presence, as I was mentioning at the beginning, of this mode of development that is called spiral cleavage. Okay? So the starting point for these three different species is the same, spiral cleavage. The end point of these species is the same, a worm, a segmented worm. But they get from here to here through three different pathways, three different life cycles. Owenia does it with a feeding larva, Capitella does it with a lecithotrophic, non-feeding, and Dimorphilus does it directly. So this is the perfect system now to try to understand and answer the question of how this is happening, right? How these different life cycles evolve? Why you have similar starting and end point, but then a completely different life cycle, right? And the first thing that we did was 
uh, looking at the life cycle, okay? Uh, let's get the life cycle of these, uh, of these guys. We know it pretty well because we work with them. We do a lot of developmental biology. And we decided to say, okay, well, how are developmental programs, how are genes actually controlling this thing? Let's try to understand and, and pinpoint and identify the, the genetic changes that are uh, driving these different life cycles. So we got the life cycle, the development, and then collected samples at different time points here uh, as an orange dot, uh, and then start doing functional genomics or comparative genomics, okay? So, um, I mean, it might get perhaps a bit abstract. <laughs> if you have any question uh, or doubt, you can just simply answer it, uh, ask it, and then I, I will try to answer it, okay? <coughs> okay. So um, the first thing is, is that you can start seeing, okay, how genes are you know, being deployed during the life cycle. And you can see how as the animals start developing, they start expressing more genes. That that's makes sense, right? Because they start from development. It's easy. It's simple. There are only a few cells, but things during development start getting more complicated. You start differentiating tissues, cell types, organs, making things more complex. So then genes start to be activated. Now, because these are pretty similar and close, relatively close, evolutionary, you can identify genes that are one-to-one -one orthologue, right? That is the same gene in one species and the other one, okay? And then this is actually very powerful because then it's a way of comparing how development and how genes are working. Because you know that when you compare gene E, uh, gene A in Owenia would be exactly the same gene also. Uh, you will know exactly the same gene in the other species, right? Uh, and this is a heat map in which is showing uh, the, how similar genes are, are being expressed between different uh, stages of the direct developer here with uh, the species with larva. Just to make it very simple uh, and also probably as you would expect, when you compare the direct developer with the indirect with a feeding larva, the feeding larva is very, very different. There's no stage that is comparable in the direct development developer with the indirect, which makes sense, right? So early development is similar, the adult is similar, the larva is very, very different because the direct developer does not, does not have a larva, okay? Uh, what is interesting is that when you compare uh, the species with the two larva, with the two larvae, the larvae are also the point of maximal dissimilarity. So the two larvae of the species within direct development are also the point of maximal dissimilarity. So they are very different as well, okay? And this is interesting. So larvae are somehow stages that are different in terms of gene expression, right? <coughs> now you can get all the genes in the genome and then try to see how they are expressed. And basically, this, is, this would be the visual representation. So all the rows are a gene. These are times. And then red would be high expression. And then you see how, during development, genes start to be activated uh, in, a, in, in different fashion, in, in, in groups of co-regulated genes, OK? And this, is very sim this, is, this makes sense because genes form networks of, of regulation, right? So then when you activate one gene, you will also activate the one that is uh, downstream, and so on and so forth. But this is important because this allows us somehow to test one of the scenarios that was historically posed uh, for the evolution of larva. So if you remember, the first scenario was saying that larvae evolve by getting genes in the adult into, larvae, into larval stages. So through this, we would hypothesize that if that was the case, we should see genes in the adult being also expressed in the larva, right? Because they were kind of co-opted. And this is not what we see. Genes that are in the juvenile, you know, they are not expressed early or at least during formation of the larva, okay? It might be, it might be that actually this is just one gene, and then through this approach, you are just missing that gene. But at least we can say that this scenario, it, if that was true, the evolution of larva didn't involve massive recruitment of genes in the adult. Um, we can do the same with the other species, and it's interesting the fact that uh, we see uh, the same dynamics. 
Now, the interesting thing, what we can do is try to see, okay, the genes that are expressed here are the same between the two different species, right? And this allows us to start in trying to infer whether the developmental genes that are acting during larva formation are the same or not. And we can start making hypotheses, well, perhaps the genes that make the larva are completely different between two different species, or they are completely the same, or things are more complicated. And the reality is that things are way more complicated. Er genes, the genes that start or control early development are very similar between different species, and the genes that make the adult are also more or less similar between different annelid species. Again, making sense because they have spiral cleavage and they are worms. But the genes making the, the, the larva are very different. They might have similar dynamics, but they are different. So we can summarize this in this way, and many of them are like enzymes. Okay, and then for instance, you know, uh, by these we can identify genes that are acting differently. For instance, here, uh, genes acting during larva formation of winia that are not active in the other larva are, for instance, the ones that make these spikes that the, this larva has that are the kitty, very uh, defining future analytes, right, polykids. Uh, and similarly, genes that are active in this larva but not in this one are the ones that are eating the yolk, okay, at autophagy, okay? So basically, this is telling us that evolution of larvae is very complicated. And at the end, it's a mix of processes. There are conserved genes, there are new genes, and there are genes that are simply being active earlier or later because the larvae are simply different. They have different biology. But, uh, well, we wanted to focus on developmental genes, on developmental programs, and that's why we focus on transcription factors. And here came the big surprise. Because when you focus on transcription factors, so on developmental regulators, and then you compare the direct developer here with the species with larva, what you see is that transcription factors, developmental programs that are activated late in the larva, because you have this intermediate stage, are all being activated very early in the direct developer. So the direct developer somehow is doing everything at once because it's forming already the worm, right, during development. While the species with larva are somehow breaking things into two phases because you have this intermediate stage. Now, because we have two species, we can say, okay, what are these transcription factors? And what we found were 28, so just a handful of master regulators that were being changed in time during the life cycle when comparing the direct developer with those with larva, okay? And just to make things very easy, uh, basically uh, two genes uh, stood up. Uh, most of them were omega domain genes. But two genes stood up as being Hox genes. So I don't know if you're familiar with Hox genes, but these are genes that are patterning our uh, anterior posterior axis, right? They define our segments. They define this will be forebrain. This will be a leg. This will be an arm, okay? So they are critical to pattern our body. And that was quite interesting because you would imagine that well, the genes should function the same way, right? Um, and actually, we had studied uh, Hox genes in this species. So we, before we had, been, uh, we had studied the Hox genes in, in the direct developer, and, and as the data was showing, they were being activated very, very early on in development, just right after gastrulation. And some people, other people, had studied uh, the, uh, Hox genes in the other species, in Capitella, and they showed something similar. They were activating, they were active also quite early in development, during larva formation. So uh, you can see here how actually Hox genes were very, very late in, in the larva. So we say, okay, what's going on with the larva of Owinia, actually, then? Uh, so we identify the Hox genes, they are there, same genes, and, and yeah. It's true, Hox genes are not patterning the larva. They are not, only one Hox gene here was expressed in the larva of, of Owinia. And Hox genes were activated very late in the larval life, when the larva is starting to grow, to eat, and the actual worm is starting to form. So the worm forms inside the larva in this region here. That is called the, the, the that would be the juvenile primordia. And you see how they are starting, they start to be expressed, and actually they are start to be expressed in this staggered position along the anterior posterior axis. So Hox genes, like Hox one would be more anterior, posterior Hox would be more posterior. Anyway, 
when you look at the adult, you see this staggered position. So this hox one is more anterior, this posterior is more posterior, okay? So here we have a situation in which hox genes are very, very, very late, very, very late, very different, okay? Um, so um, then we decided, okay, but maybe this is just a thing with hox genes. So what we did was finding genes that are only in the head and then finding genes that are only in the, in the tail of the, of the larva, of, sorry, of Owinia. And we actually see the same trend, right? The early development of, of, of the planktotrophic of the feeding larva is dominated by anterior genes. So the, the animal is first forming the head, the anterior part. And only when you have the larva and this larva starts to grow, this species starts to form the trunk, okay? Um, and when compared with the other species, we clearly see this, okay? So these are genes involved in the trunk along, uh, through, uh, in, compared with the three different species. And you see how these genes are only being activated late in development in the one that has a feeding larva, while it starts a bit earlier in the one that has a larva that doesn't need to feed. And it's, they are expressed very, very early during early development in the one that is direct, okay? So what we found is that there was this heterochronic, heterochronic shift, that this is the, basically the term that is being used in, in evolutionary biology. Uh, there's this temporal shift in how a big part of the body, our trunk, so basically from here to here, is formed in these three different species with these three different uh, life cycles. So that's basically the summary, right? Uh, the species with a lecithotrophic larva starts trunk formation very early on, relatively similar to what the direct developer does it, while the one that has a feeding larva is pushing the formation of the trunk way, way late in development after the larva has hatched and swum and, and lived uh, its life, okay? So the next stage, uh, and I will try to go <coughs> quickly through this, um, we wanted to, to know how, how this could have uh, been actually uh, regulated, right? And we decided to go from genes, from pure genes and checking gene expression and developmental patterns to actually epigenomics, right? Uh, gene regulation. So the question would be, how are these different dynamics of pattern form, of, of trunk formation uh, being controlled? What is changing uh, and, and how is being, this being done? Uh, and to do this, uh, my lab, uh, so my lab actually is interested in, in understanding how gene regulation and genome regulation is controlling the evolution of animal form. Uh, and to, to answer this particular question, we decided to use this technique that is called ataxic or ataxic which is basically um, um, a tool um, to identify open chromatin regions. So that would be genomes, uh, regions in the genome that are open so that other transcription factors and, and you know, uh, developmental regulators and, and, and gene expression regulators can bind the DNA and start doing uh, their thing, right? So basically uses this thin TN5 that will identify these open regions and sit there, cleave, and then form a library in a very simplified form. What this allows you is to identify regions in the genome <coughs> that, have, that are open and probably have a regulatory function, right? So the, this, you, you see it here, that would be a, three different views. And what is very interesting is that because you do it, we, we did it in, in temporal way, we can identify regions that are only active at one particular stage and other regions that are only active at another uh, particular stage, right? For instance, this is just only on the competent, this is only early in development, and this would be just simply constitutive. It's always active, right? Um, so uh, we did this for these two different species and again do comparative. So how are these functions and how are these regions being uh, deployed? And uh, again, uh, consistent with what we were seeing, uh, most uh, of, the, of the regulatory regions that we identified in the one that has late trunk formation are active during early development, while these ones are played way more gradually, right? Consistent with this idea that things are forming more gradually in the direct developer and in the one that has a larva that has a metamorphosis that is more gradual that forms the trunk early uh, after the uh, gastrulation, while not in the other one. And this, you can see here, 
which is so that you get a bit more convinced. These are the, how these regulatory regions associate with genes that are involved in different process of morphogenesis. A lot of these peaks are played later in development, while in the other one, in the lecithotrophic, they are more or less active throughout the entire development. Anyway. Uh, what is powerful of this technique is that because you identify the regions that have a regulatory, re a regulatory function, you can know the sequence of these regions. And therefore, you can try to identify what are the things that are binding these sequences, right, these regions. Um, so you can identify these, the promoters and the enhancers, and then you can predict what are the sequences that are there that are doing something. And for instance, you can identify motives that are probably associated to particular transcription factors. And therefore, because you know uh, when they are activated, you can start reconstructing gene regulatory networks, right? So that's a little bit what we try to do. Um, <coughs> and again, you can go back and do something very similar to what I showed you uh, before with, with genes and try to say, okay, now I know these regulatory sequences and I know these regulatory elements what happens and how similar are these two species, okay? So I'm just simply simplifying a, a lot. You can then get all that information, summarize it into a square with a color that tells you whether it's very similar or very dissimilar. And we can, you can make hypotheses and say, well, yeah, because they are activating the trunk at different timings, the regulatory elements will be just simply completely different. Or perhaps no, perhaps they are the same, same regulatory elements, but then active with different things and things like that. Anyway, what we found is that there was a very similarity in some regulatory modules that were active at the moment in which the trunk started to be formed in the lecithotrophic, that were late in the one that was forming the trunk, very late, okay, the feeding one. So again, what we saw with all these different approaches is a confirmation of this temporal change, of this heterochronic change between the two species with, with the different larvae, okay? Somehow, there are genes and the regulatory elements that are active early in development to activate the trunk that are pushed in, in time late for the uh, competent larva. And among these uh, regulatory elements, we found the uh, one that is controlling the activity of the Hox genes. So kind of confirming what we saw with the gene expression. So you see here the activity of the Hox uh, regulatory element that is very high at the late larval stage in the one that feeds, in Owinia, but then has this peak uh, at the stage at, it, at which the uh, trunk starts to be formed in the lecithotrophic one, in the feeding one, okay? Um, and because we know this element, we can start saying, okay, so then what, how is this being controlled? And this is very interesting because you see how, uh, focusing on just the Hox genes, you see how the Hox genes suffer our experience, <coughs> a complete change in regulatory dynamics at the stage in which the trunk starts to be formed in Capitella, so in the one that is alethitotrophic, but then this is way late, late in development in the one that has this feeding larva, okay? So again, pointing towards this Hox gene as, an, as a key element to drive uh, trunk formation. And you can see what might be driving this, and this is interesting because uh, the elements that might be driving this change, these different dynamics, are probably similar. So it might be that you just simply have a handful of regulators that are similar between the two species that are just simply functioning in different manners, right? And they activate also a, a conserve cascade of, of, of developmental genes that are just simply being temporally deployed differently between the two species. Anyway, um, let's just make it uh, summarize uh, what, basically, what, what we basically found. So this would be our bilateral adult with, with the trunk uh, patterned by the hawks. What we found is that in the larva, in the species that form a larva that feeds, the larva basically <laughs> just develops into an anterior head territory. And it starts forming the trunk way late in development as it feeds, as it swims, and as it does its own life, right? Uh, and this is what in some publications being called a head larva, a swimming larva, okay? So there are this group of animals, and this particularly we found it in Owinia, in which they form just a tiny 
swimming head that will be leading and doing, and doing the, their thing. And as they do, they feed and start growing and start forming the trunk. While in other species, and in particular the ones that have lecithotrophic, this uh, trunk formation has been pushed forward in development. So that then during development, during larval formation, you already have this trunk that is maximally observed when you go into the nophilus, into the direct developer, in which already during early development, the trunk is formed. Okay? So what is ancestral then? What is the first, what is the original thing, at least for annelids? Well, you can then go back to the phylogeny. We know where these species are in the annelid phylogeny, and then you can plot these things, this way of developing in, in the phylogeny. And then you see that species that are at the base of the annelid tree, they tend to show this late formation of the trunk, this, you know, delaying the formation of the trunk at late stages. While when you go to this errantian, sedentary, and so on, you see how this formation of the trunk has been pushed forward in, in embryogenesis. So we can conclude that probably the formation of this head swimming or head larva was probably an ancestral feature of uh, uh, annelid development, so basically a feeding larva, and that's also not completely crazy, has been proposed several times, but now we can describe this larva from a developmental perspective. And then it gives you a story of how the different life cycles have evolved in annelids, just by predisplacing trunk formation in different lineages uh, in a, in different, um, independently and convergently, okay? Just simply bringing forward the formation of the trunk to early development. And as this has happened, because they form already the trunk, they don't need to have these larval traits and then larval traits start to disappear, okay? Um, is this crazy? Is this just simply something that annelids do? Well, the answer is no. Actually, head larvae are ubiquitous in the animal phyla. They are not something completely crazy that is just simply a specialization of annelids. So this is, another, this is the sea urchin larva. Again, it is mostly formed through uh, uh, anterior territories. It's just a head. It's an anterior ectoderm form. This is foronid. This is an emertin. This is a disothean, the crustacean larva. These are um, a hemicorded larva. So head larva, he larvae derived from anterior territories are ubiquitous. And interestingly, in all cases, they also delay the activation of the Hox genes to late in development in the life of, of the larva. So again, what you are seeing is that a similar developmental mechanism underpinning the formation of completely different larva, okay? And what we did was getting also transcriptomics of all these different larva, at least the ones that were available, and then checking how similar the expression of these genes were between the different life cycles. And what we found was that when comparing larval phases, even when you go to an Iderian, the most similar stages of development between these very, very, very different animals occur at the larval stage, okay? Not early in development, not late, but at the larval stage. So these are larvae that are very, very different morphologically, but they are using similar developmental approaches and strategies and gene expression. Now you can choose your explanation. Um, you know, it's debated, um, but basically you can think of two alternative possibilities to explain this. Either this is all convergent uh, or this is all ancestral, okay? So it could be that during animal evolution, animals have evolved larvae and they have done that in a similar way by delaying trunk formation. Okay, by delaying the activation of Hox genes to late stages. So the first way of forming a larva was just, okay, I will not form the trunk now, I will just push it later, I will form some head stuff that I will just specialize to do what I need to do, that will be my larva, and then later I will activate the, the trunk. And this has happened independently. So that would be one possibility, that all this is convergent. But we can also think that perhaps this happened very, very early on in the evolution of bilaterians, because at the end of the day, bilaterians are the animals that have a head and a trunk. And then perhaps the evolution of head and trunk is actually associated to the fact that somehow 
there was a body region that started to be evolved late in the life cycle. Okay, so it was kind of terminally added. Uh, and that is interesting because if that would be the case, that perhaps would explain why bilateral animals have so different trunks, right? And to some extent, our, the, a big difference between the animal phyla is that some have a wormy trunk that is segmented, and another one has a trunk with legs, and another one has a trunk with, fly, with, with wings and stuff like that. So perhaps this fact that the trunk is delayed is increasing the evolvability of this body region to adapt and generate new forms and functions. Um, I don't know. These are the two possibilities. Uh, pick yours. Um, and, and that's it. Um, I just want to thank uh, the people involved. Uh, so most of the work, so that was a collective effort, but a lot of the work that's basically done, most of the work that's done by Fran, uh, Spanish from Madrid, actually, uh, and Jan. Um, <coughs> in collaboration with other people uh, and then supported by, by the ERC. So um, thank you for your attention. Happy to take any question that you might have. Yeah. Thanks for this nice talk. Are there questions? Well, maybe I start. Or do you want to start? Hi, Tim. A okay. great talk. Very beautiful, very uh, <coughs> engaging. Um, just a curiosity. How mm. many specimens are you using for doing this transcriptome uh, analysis for the gastrula, mm. for different stages mm. with a very low amount of tissue? I'm mm. just wondering what's the... Uh, it should be like a, a very limited amount of, mm. uh, of uh, mm. transcriptome, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. how many? Um, so the first, what we, we, we had to troubleshoot basically the amount of embryos. Uh, so we mostly were picking like around 200. For most of the stages, we were getting like 200 embryos. I mean, for some, for Owinia, it's basically a free spawner. So each individual will spawn thousands. So that was not a, a big issue. For Owinia, the big issue was that it's extremely fast. So it develops from egg to larva in, in less than 24 hours. So the earliest stages of development happen like, like, like lightning speed. So I mean, we were just, uh, we were just uh, basically working together to manage to get the 200 uh, uh, individuals. But yeah, generally 200, 200, 300. Then when it's later stages, you need less because then there are more cell types, and there's more RNA, so maybe 150, something like that, yeah. And one more thing. Uh, I was just wondering, because there's uh, some literature about some <coughs> pionids mm. with direct yes. development, and then yes. Uh, yes. they shift into lar uh, yeah. direct development, and then and they have like a lysitroph lysitrophic or, or yes. plantotrophic larvae. Have you uh, thought about yep. using them as a... <coughs> Just like them. Too. Yeah, so that's that's a, gr a great question, so, yeah, um, uh, so that's uh, it's called pothelogony. So basically, uh, it's a it's a trait that is selected. So there are females that produce feeding and females that produce non-feeding. So uh, we we are collaborating with uh, with Christina Thakas in the states, and and she's using one spy on it to to try to understand this. Yeah, but definitely, I think that this then that that's the the ideal situation, right? Because then now you can say, okay, well, we see this as a general trend. What is happening then in a particular species? And perhaps some of the, you know, um, yeah, it allows you to per perhaps dissect better how these changes in trunk formation might have happened. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. More? I, I have a question. About yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, getting closer to the species level, when you're looking within a general, a genus or something, <coughs> Normally, you have the, always the transition from plantotrophic to lecithotrophic or direct developments, not the other way around. So you can already guess that is the ancestral stage is the, uh, the plantotrophic. And mm. if you have a plantotrophic larvae that has to be in the water column, you need to eat, you need to have a mouth, you need to have a head. Yeah. So basically, it's more or less what you're saying, but, but yeah. more in the, from an ecological point of view, I guess. Yeah, I agree. 
although apparently it's not so, like for instance, half Sprunar, uh, which probably you know, um, it's a firm believer that the lecithotrophic is ancestral, which, yeah. Yeah, but, but <laughs> yeah. When, when you look at the, uh, what I'm saying is, in, yes. in our, in our conis lace, for example, it's easy to see that always you have plantotrophic larvae and then the they develop it. Exactly. And there are ecological reasons <coughs> for making that transition. Because yeah. you don't want your, your larvae to get, out, uh, get away and disappear in the, when you're in an oceanic island, for example. Exactly. And, and, and that, then, that they might just get lost and not find the proper suitable. And, and once you have changed your development to become direct developer, it's, it's no way back to, to, to become a, a half a larva that is feeding. Which is, w exactly, which f f for, for me, at least for a developmental bio as a developmental biologist, is interesting because then if you can change it in one direction, why cannot you do it on yeah, the other so, one? So, so what at some point there will, must be a, a stage in the larval development that you get canalized to, to one yeah. and, and you cannot come back. Yeah, exactly. I guess. And, and that would be, in, in, yeah, I mean, I, ideally I would like to find out, to find out what. what. <laughs> yeah. More questions? So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tima. <laughs> thank you very much.